We can't thank you enough for subscribing to the Clive Barker Podcast. In episode 266, Desay and Ryan discuss recent news. The powerful new Candyman trailer everyone should see. Uh, Hellbound was the last episode of the season for Joe Bob Briggs' The Last Drive-In with guests Ashley Lawrence and Doug Bradley. And Clive Barker is suing for the rights to his creation, Hellraiser. Well, welcome. This is episode 266 of the Clive Barker podcast, and I'm Ryan. And I'm Joe. And um, so this is actually, you know, every time we have a news episode, I wonder if there's not going to be much news and then stuff just pops up right before we start. And yeah. Yeah. So this this was no exception, but and um, but first off, we've got a Candyman trailer, and this is not like any movie trailer I've ever seen, right? I mean, this is this was really cool. Um, did you did you get a chance to see it? The uh, I did. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's animated to look like puppets. Yes. So in a way, this reminded me of the story of the, you know, the Harry Potter story of the three wizard brothers who cheat death and they get like the cloak, the invisibility cloak and the, mm. the, the, the deathly hollows, you know, the story. You remember that you ever saw the Harry Potter movies? I have, but I, I don't, I don't know if I remember that or not. I think I've only seen okay. them one time. So the trailer is done in this sort of like, you know, uh, shadow cut, sh- shadow cut puppets and uh you know it's it's about um it's about black people and how you know society mistreats them yeah and uh someone moves into a house in the neighborhood it's a black guy and then everybody in the neighborhood starts saying oh you know uh we don't like this and then they all get together and they're like how dare this guy move into our neighborhood and they kill him and lynch him and drag him in a truck and leave him in the middle of nowhere and then it's a little kid in a bicycle just driving through a neighborhood and for some reason gets arrested and then he's put on trial and is you know killed yeah. or the story of the painter daniel robitaille you know he's he's but i think they give it a twist on this one because I don't know if you noticed, but they they depicted Daniel Robitaille making a portrait of Helen, and and she's just sitting up on a high pedestal holding a rose, and she looks really bored. And yeah. then she, she they kind of look at each other, and and he and the the rose gets dropped on the floor, and then the next thing you see like this big top headed like gentleman, yeah. and the Helen seems to be like kneeling next to him holding his hand crying about something and and all of a sudden they take daniel robitaille into the field and they cut his hand off and they put a hook in it and they burn him alive and it made it seem almost like like helen accused daniel of rape or something like that which would have been a reason for the for him to be lynched back in the colonial times it's pretty pretty different um, didn't they also show that little boy that was electrocuted for like raping a, a woman in this? I He's thought, just driving a bicycle and all of a sudden you see people pointing at him and then yeah. he's put on trial. It yeah, doesn't really show him there, there doing was, anything. There was a real life story of a kid, like a 14 year old kid put in the electric chair. Oh, and it was um, something like that. Are you know? talking about Emmett Till? Maybe, yeah, and he was he was innocent, and and uh, and it was like a really young kid put in the electric chair. It's really horrible. I think he, I think he was lynched or something. If it's the same one I'm thinking, and then decades later, the the woman who accused him of that actually said that uh, they had just made it up. You know, and it's oh, terrible. God. Anyway, yeah, but I remember so, something about a kid in an, in an electric chair. Hmm. But well, we anyway. can definitely look that up. Yeah. But uh, the trailer is really powerful, and it's done with yeah. these like little shadow puppets, and uh, made by I'm assuming Nia Da Costa, the director of Candyman. That's pushed back to when is it pushed back to again? It's like uh, September or September, something. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think I think this trailer is worth watching a couple of times because you know you you're not expecting what you see at first, and it takes a little while for your mind to adjust to you know these. Compare these comparative real life sort of stories of injustice to 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 black people, yeah, and and uh, you know and then and then showing Candyman and it's like Candyman is the spirit rising up, you know, to get revenge. 
Right. And then they show a painter, which I'm assuming is going to be the protagonist of our movie. He's he's just painting all these portraits. And I think what he does in the movie, isn't he painting portraits of alleged Candyman victims or is he painting um, – uh, now I'm confused because I don't know a lot about – I've been trying to not spoil myself on the new Candyman. Yeah. But I know that he's a painter and he paints these uh, these these big, big close-up portraits of other people. Yeah. And so it's like he's painting the portraits of these victims who have been – uh, you know, suffered injustice in the past. Yeah. And as he does that, you see that he's kind of in, uh, uh, uh incarnating the spirit of Candyman, yeah. and at the end the bee shows up in his eye and and all the victims that we've seen happen all through this teaser trailer you see them rise as Candyman also rises from the flames of his immolation and you know uh yeah it's powerful it's like um it's like yep the people are gonna rise up and yeah they're not taking it anymore and the hook slashes the screen, and you see Candyman, and yeah. um, and it cuts to black. So really powerful stuff. I'm I'm stoked about this Candyman movie. I'm uh, yeah. I'm really interested in seeing what they're going to come up with. Well, and if she she, I assumed, and maybe I'm wrong. I have no idea, but I assumed that this trailer was made special, and that it's not part of the movie, right? I mean, does it sort of seem that way? It could be. I mean, yeah. for example, for the Harry Potter one, they did bring up that. Uh, Deathly Hollows legend uh, video into the movie, so I, it could be a part of an exposition scene. But it, yeah. like you said, it could also be just a teaser. There's plenty yeah. of teaser trailers who end up not having stuff in the actual movie, so there's a good yeah. possibility of that. And and when I took it that way, it also to me felt like, oh wow, Nia Da Costa really cares about this movie. Yeah, yeah, so, I, I agree. So yeah, I'm I'm excited. You know, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to this uh, to this Candyman coming out, and and we'll find out for ourselves. I think there should be more views on this because as I'm looking at this, uh, the particular video that I'm looking at only has about eight thousand views, and yeah. more people should see this because it's a really well done, really amazing trailer. Well, um, and the the trailer that like the, I think where most people saw it, she had it embedded into uh, into Twitter. Mm-hmm. And and so the 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 one that I put in the show notes was like a YouTube version because it it was kind of hard to I don't know I thought it would be better to find it on YouTube and and uh, link that but yeah we need to find the version that was <laughs> uploaded by the studio that's yeah. that's probably the one that has the most views yeah and let's see I'm clicking on mine right now I, the one that I that I shared yeah I think yours is from a channel on YouTube called Straight from a Movie. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So that's probably – yeah, that's why it's only 8,000. It's just some weird channel. The thing is with trailers is as soon as they hit the internet, there is a whole ton of like trailer channels that will just uh, re-upload it. Yeah. And uh, you, you can take your pick. But usually I try to pick the one that comes directly from the studio if I can find it. So that's that's uh, that's cool that they're still keeping the flame alive, even though we're yeah. in this weird transition period where cinemas are pushing back and there's still no no open movie theaters that I know of near me, at least. Um, I'm assuming a lot of movie theaters are still closed. Uh, but, yeah, they're they're definitely stoking the flame, keeping it alive, trying to get people to remember that, hey, you know, this is still coming. <laughs> yeah. It's uh I don't want them to just drop this on a streaming service. I want to see this in a theater. Um, you know, I th- I, don't, I don't even know if our. I mean, I think theoretically our movie theater could be open, but there's mm-hmm. like they probably don't have anything to show. I mean, in Fairbanks, yeah. Oh, you know what I saw recently in Fairbank? Uh, I don't know if this is near Fairbanks, but you know oh, that movie, the, the bus, it, yeah, Into the Wild, mm-hmm. the the. The movie about that guy oh, yeah, who uh, yeah. yep. went out no, to I, live in. I know in, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but for those who don't, uh, that bus that was uh, in the movie Into the Wild, where that guy went to live in 
in the middle of the woods, and then he ended up getting sick and too weak to come back to civilization, and he ended up dying. They finally airlifted that thing out of the woods because, for some reason, people just kept on trying to make the trek to it, and it meant a lot to a lot of people, and it, it was just dangerous to have those people go into the woods to visit that. So yeah. I saw the, the huge helicopter with the double propellers, you know, just taking that thing out. Yep, and, and, uh, and uh, emergency services, it would cost a lot of money to uh, the Denali borough, and emergency services would have to you know, rescue people, and some people died trying to get to it. And and the dumb thing is, the, the, there's another bus exactly like it. It's the one they used in the movie, and it's mm-hmm. at a restaurant, like right there off of the main road. People could just go to that. Got to profit off of that, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, they just left it there, and so the the yeah the restaurant Forty uh, Ninth State Grill in Denali, they just took that. So it's right there in their parking lot, so people can go take pictures in in that one instead of trying to make that trek. I mean, the whole port, part big part of that movie was how dangerous it was to go to that. Right. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so we were talking about the movie theaters being closed, and uh, there's still a lot of people who watch movies through streaming services, and there's one in particular, right, Shudder, that um, dri- drive-ins are actually making a comeback, right? So I- I've seen this in um, in a few articles lately. There's uh, there's some drive-ins and uh, new drive-ins that are being created for people to be able to sit in their cars and watch a movie. And there's a show on Shutter called uh, The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs. Uh, so they actually have been doing uh, a season every year for the last few years. Mm-hmm. And this year's season, on I think it was the finale, uh, they brought back Hellbound Hellraiser 2. Yeah. And they had a couple of special guests, right? Yeah, so um, I went to watch this, and I, I had some trouble with it because I guess, I don't know, my Shutter app on my phone, you know, I'm, I'm alone with my son, so I'm trying not to watch it on a big screen because I don't want, he's not ready to see Hellbound. Uh, <laughs> and, but then I had, to, I had to go run an errand, and when I came back, I thought it would just, because it was live, I thought it would just join back in progress, and, you know, I'd be a little further along in the movie because, I mean, I love Hell, Hellbound, but I've seen it a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to see the end, you know, with the mm-hmm. discussion and stuff. But it's well, they have different segments in between. So they 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 pause the movie where oh, you'd have really? usually a commercial break. Yeah, there's several different segments throughout the movie where they stop, oh. and and they talk to the actors or the special guests. So yeah. Well, so I it, so it started all over again when I got back, and there was no way to fast forward to where I was. And hmm, that's uh, so, weird. Yeah, so I didn't. Uh, I, I at least not on the phone app, so I right. might have to go back to it later if that's even possible. Yeah, yeah, do that. I've I've never had problems with Shutter, and I've always been able to do that. Maybe it's because it was during Friday night when they actually were live streaming it. Yeah, um, it was probably still in that block of time, and yeah, I actually have it on Amazon, so. I was actually just skimming through it before we started this because last night I had to go out. It was our 10th anniversary of me and my wife, and so we uh, went out, and I didn't have a chance to watch it. But uh, definitely watching this over the weekend, it was so much fun. Uh, Joe Bob Briggs wrote uh, an article, a review, I think, for uh, Hellraiser. It was called (laughs) Sex in the Attic with Devil Head Slime. There you go. (laughs) There you go. Took the words right out of my mouth. So that's in Shadows in Eden. You can, yeah. you, if you have that book, go read that because it's an awesome review of, of Hellraiser. But this one was Hellbound, Hellraiser Two, and um, that's fun. That's fun to see people still, you know, having a, a lot of fun watching these movies and uh, and being able to bring back Doug Bradley, who's recovering right now from his health issues, and he's been busy, right, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So there are now six parts on YouTube for Doug Bradley's uh, for Doug Bradley's reading of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So you can uh, you can go do six parts of his of his uh, audio book. I don't know if that covers the whole thing. It maybe it doesn't. I'm not sure. Um, but it's yeah. a pretty it's a short book, but. Um each one of these is about 40 minutes long. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I think it might be still in progress. I haven't really watched the last one. That but uh, like but he's obviously doing more than one part a week because we've been reporting on this for just a couple of weeks and he's already done six parts. So, so That's it, right. It'll, it'll probably be finished here 
you know, in in very pretty short order. Uh, yeah, and he does that on his, you know, nook where he uh, has – he does this in a corner of his room. He's got some cool stuff in the background, uh, a lot of pictures of, of, uh, of Nosferatu, you know, yeah. Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera, Boris Karloff, um, all these – Amazing actors and characters that he's uh, he's been fascinated with over the years, and he mentions them a lot in his book, uh, Be- Behind the Mask of the Horror Actor. Uh, very soothing video to listen to. Frankenstein is a beautiful book by Mary Shelley yeah. and, and Percy Shelley. A lot of people don't know there's a lot of differences between the first version and then the second edition that had extensive rewrites by Percy Shelley. So he kind of edited the book a little bit for his wife, but oh. I, I've had a chance to read both versions, and uh, it's really good. So yeah, go check it out. Doug Bradley reading Frankenstein. It's yeah. he started doing this uh, during the lockdown, and uh, like a lot of other YouTubers, started reading books and stories. Neil Gaiman started reading some short stories, I think, uh, or he allowed some people to read his short stories. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's been a lot of cool stuff for people who like to listen to audiobooks. I mean, I know you drive a lot, right? So you listen yeah. to a lot of audiobooks. Yep. Yeah. And I, there's and there's people who can't read because they have, you know, they're visually impaired or anything. This is a great way for them to consume these amazing stories as well. Yeah. Well, and and uh, speaking of Doug Bradley, I suppose um Hell in Hellraiser news, Clive Barker is suing for the rights to uh, the legal rights to to adaptations of the Hellbound Heart and uh, and anything that came from the movie Hellraiser. Uh, so so it's kind of like the way I the way I read it, and and this was a um, this was posted by an attorney uh, by an entertainment lawyer. Yes, Larry um, Zerner. Yeah, on Twitter. And so the way I understood it is it's the Hellbound Heart and Hellraiser and anything that came from the movie Hellraiser. So, like, Pinhead and the Puzzle Box and stuff like that would be sort of off limits. Yeah, so he's um, he's trying to get a, uh, what do you call it, a, a declaration from a judge saying that whether or not he can receive the rights back mm. uh, to the Hellraiser script, the Hellraiser trademark, uh, yeah. and the Hellbound Heart story. Uh, and he's suing, uh, he's putting as defendants on this Lawrence Cuppen mm-hmm. and def- uh, Park Avenue Entertainment LLC. So he's trying to get them to to give him back the rights to, to Hellraiser. And When New World Pictures or New World Entertainment ended, I think that Larry Cuppen got the rights to Hellraiser. He bought them from a guy called Ron Perelman. I'm just doing this by memory now. I don't really have – let me just grab something here. I I think I might have some notes from Paul Kane's book, The Hellraiser Films and Their Legacy. And his his rights were specific to Hellraiser 3, which is why you'll see on, like, Funko Pops and figures and stuff, they'll always say, this is the Hellraiser 3 pinhead, or, you know, they just inexplicably say Hellraiser 3 on the packaging, and, and that's the reason. It's like if you say Hellraiser 1, then it's you get it's the, the rights had previously belonged to, was it like New World or, or uh, the Weinstein Company, and, you know, they weren't doing that stuff. Right. So, so people would go to Larry Larry Cuppen, who would do anything. I mean, he would he would he would uh, he would agree to anything. So then they could always make a Hellraiser three pinhead. Yeah. So that was purchased uh, after New World movies went under, and then there was a group of attorneys and a group of investors who bought those rights, and then uh, Lawrence Cuppen came into the scene with Hellraiser three. Uh, then after that, Hellraiser four. It was at that point it was Transatlantic Entertainment that owned that, 
And then Dimension went into the scene and they started distributing Hellraiser and also becoming having a say on the movies and the sequels. And then finally, the last thing I've heard is that Spyglass Entertainment and David S. Goyer, they were the ones who were developing the Hellraiser reboot that they're trying to do, right? So David Bruckner is is developing a new take on Hellraiser for Spyglass Media and HBO announced on the TV side that they're planning a Hellraiser TV series with David Gordon Green, who wrote and produced some of those Halloween movies from 2018 and the sequels that are being done. So yeah, and Michael Doherty is also involved in that Hellraiser TV show, I think. Another thing that I found out here is that, and this is from recently, I, 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 this article came out where it said Hellraiser TV rights acquired by IT and Ready Player One producers. Mm-hmm. It says that IT producer Roy Lee and this is an article from June 29 of last year. So yeah. this this might be a year old. So in the meantime, HBO has already stepped in the scene. But one year ago, it said here that Hellraiser TV rights had been acquired by Roy Lee and Ready Player One producer Dan Farah. And they acquired the small screen rights to the long-running horror franchise Hellraiser. So in the meantime, I guess, you know, HBO stepped into the scene and they're trying to develop that. So it's unclear whether or not this declaratory judgment that Clyde Barker is trying to get would affect the TV side of things. So an interesting point, part of that, uh, down at the bottom of the uh, complaint, right, there was the the response from Larry Cuppin. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Rivdell, I guess, is the name of his company. And and basically what he said was, our agreement was written under UK law, not United States, so it doesn't matter. Huh. And then Clive Barker's attorney came back and said, yes, it does. You know, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> that's kind of where it's at right now. I mean, the company is, uh, you know, Park Avenue Entertainment is American. He's an American citizen, Lawrence Cuppin. He lives in Miami-Dade area, and he's, yeah. you know, been a California resident for a long time. So, yeah, yeah I'm not sure how that works. And <laughs> I don't know either. And, and, and I think probably the attorneys don't really know for sure how, it, how this stuff's going to wash out. You know, this stuff is really confusing for someone like us who are not in the industry (laughs) and who don't have any privileged information in terms of legal documents that we're just the audience side, right? So all we can do is look at the stuff that shows up like this document and try to understand it as best as possible. I've never been to a courthouse. I've never had any lawsuits or anything like that. So to me, there's a lot of stuff that shows up here that's complete legalese that it's really hard for me to understand. There's whole paragraphs where it's like very extremely vague stuff that that just mentioned the defendant declares that blah, 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 and, and all instances thereof of defendant, blah, blah, blah. It's like, what does this even mean? It doesn't mean anything. So... I've had to read case law for like real estate and stuff, and I've had to re- you know, and I've had to take people to court for non-payment of rent. Um, that's the extent of <laughs> my of my knowledge. But copyright stuff is like pretty well beyond me. Um, but yeah. I think a lot of this stuff has to get proven in court, right? And there mm-hmm. has to there has to be examples, and so I think that's what kind of where we're at. And I don't. I believe it's not like totally cut and dry and that it's just it's going to have to wait and see what happens. Well, there's a part an important part of the document that mentions why Clyde Barker is trying to do this. It says yeah. in paragraph 15, the Copyright Act's termination provisions reflect a deliberate calibration of the author publisher balance. New York Times versus Tassini, 533 U.S. 483, 495, 2001. In furtherance of this balance, terminated grantees or their successors, like defendants, and this is Larry Cuppin and Park yeah. Avenue Entertainment, can continue to exploit prior derivative works, e.g. the 10 Hellraiser films from 1987 to 2018, Under the terms of their original grants, in addition, terminated parties retain all foreign copyright interests originally granted. And then there's another legal reference here. Uh, Terminated parties are further afforded a competitive advantage to reacquire the author's recaptured copyright interests, which is common due to the terminated party's retention of foreign rights. And then there's background facts, and uh, there's a whole section there. Um talking about how the agreements were drafted and the yeah. dates. And September 9, 1986, Rivdell entered into an agreement with the 1986 New World Agreement with New World Pictures Limited, a Delaware Corporation, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, Rivdale was subsequently dissolved in or about 1991, and that's probably when Lawrence Kuppen reacquired the rights from Ron Perelman in 1991. Um, this is really complicated, guys. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. Like I've tried making an article once about the the story of the rights of Hellraiser, and I definitely was able to track some stuff up until a certain point, and then after that, it became really murky. Well, it, and then once you start talking about uh, you know acquiring libraries of movies, you don't know exactly which movies are included in those libraries, what international rights are granted, yeah. all that stuff. It's really complicated. Well, and and this is based and the 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 1976 copyright law, from what my understanding, basically says that if you know after 35 years, if you're not continuing to use it, then then it can revert back to its original creator. Yeah. Uh, so 35 years is a long time, but we're coming up on that. Was it December? I think of 2021. Uh huh. And um, that's what they're looking at, and. And then the, the the precedent that they cite and they talk about it. This was the part that was kind of frustrating to me because they talk about it like everybody knows about the, you know, the Friday the Thirteenth case, and it's like, no, nah, I don't. You know, I I had to try to try to read up on that and try to figure out what happened with Friday the Thirteenth because the you yeah. know that's news to me. Yeah, I wasn't very big on the Friday the Thirteenth franchise or movies, so I. I Knew a little bit about that stuff, but I just mm. never really bothered to get too involved in that because I didn't really have a big vested interest in Friday the 13th. But basically, at the end of this document, the request for relief says here what basically what Clive Barker wants is, wherefore, plaintiff Clive Barker prays for judgment against the defendants as follows. A, a declaration that Clive Barker's termination notice is valid and effective under the Copyright Act, and that on December 19, 2021, he will thereby own all rights under the U.S. copyrights to his works. B, a declaration that Clive Barker's exercise of his termination rights pursuant to 17 U.S. 203 does not give rise to any claim by the defendants and or their affiliates against him. C, an order awarding Clive Barker's costs of suit, including his attorney's fees, yeah. and D, for such other and further relief as the court deems just and proper. Yeah, so, so not only are you going to give me my rights back, but you're going to pay for all my court costs. Yeah, so um, basically, if, let's say, the de declaratory uh, judgment would rule in his favor, and this is a big if, then he would have his rights back by December 19 of 2021 for... The Hellraiser script, the Hellraiser movie, uh, the Hellbound Heart, so he would be able to license that out or use that to make any other, you know, develop any projects he wanted. That's what I'm assuming. I'm not certain about the TV rights, how that would work out, because that might be a different kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that that but, that's the part that's confusing to me is that because I I. You know, th this whole discussion has been about movie rights, but then the defendant is Larry Cuppin, and he has mm -hmm. television and video game rights. And I think he's also now – he also owns the, the movie rights oh, okay. somehow, or at least the, the, hel the original one, because he bought that library from New World Films. And oh. I, again, it's very complicated. I'm not sure exactly. And what happens to Spyglass? You know, who, who is Spyglass yeah. working so, with to develop the new Hellraiser movie? How and, does that work? So what we're reading is that they have to – if they get that their movie finished before December of 2021, then they're in the clear – and they're good. But I have a feeling that if it's a good movie and it goes beyond that, Clive Barker will let it go, but it'll be like, yeah, well, but now, you know, I'm going to have a little oversight or I'm going to be an executive producer. Well, it'll here's be the something thing. like that, I think. I don't think he's going to just shut him down. I'm not sure that Spyglass is able to make a Hellraiser movie by December of 2021. I don't, just because... Yeah. Just because right now all the production is not going forward, you know, movie theaters are not running, yeah. studios are slowly opening up productions, but it's still very complicated to do anything, and they don't have a distributor in place for, for their projects. So those are all things that tell me I don't think they can, in 18 months, that they can have a movie fully made, developed, produced, edited, 
completed and distributed by December of next year. Yeah. I mean, but there's been so many people no. who said they were, yeah. Unless they want to make a cheap sequel huh, yeah. or a cheap movie that would not return their with a low budget just to try to keep it. And and that's not what Hellraiser needs right now. We don't need another cheaply made, quickly hashed Hellraiser movie because we've had so many of those, right? The last yeah. five or movies or whatever have all been movies that were just like, you know, quickly put together. So some yeah. producer could spend as little money as possible to get a return on his investment. And I and think... hold on to the rights. Yeah, and hold on to the rights. And I think that... What's the point of keeping a franchise alive if basically it's a vegetable, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I, it's, you know, it's sad um, to keep a franchise alive just so you can make another movie that had like a $300,000 budget and was screened in one movie theater just so you can have that contractual obligation fulfilled. Because, oh boy, oh boy, we're going to make that big reboot one day, and that's yeah. going to make us a lot of money. Right. And and are you? I mean, at this point, yeah. it doesn't seem like Dimension ever did anything good with the the Hellraiser franchise. No, and, you know. no not really. I mean, they, they started with Hellraiser 3, right? That was their first one? I think they distributed that one, yeah, in okay. 92. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then Hellraiser 4, they meddled too much. And, uh, yeah, kind of four was just completed so they could open the way for five and six, but then it took years and years before they ever did anything like that. Yeah. And then when they shot Hellseeker and Debtor, uh, they shot them back to back. Oh, De- and Debtor then, and Hellworld were back to back, right? In Romania? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Debtor and, and Hellworld. Yeah. Shot back to back in Romania. Thank you. And those were like put on the shelf for years, right? I mean, there was a time when I was asking Doug Bradley when I saw him and he was like, I have no idea what's going on in those movies. I haven't even seen them. Yeah. And then, you know, it turns out that they were just putting them on the shelf so they could release them at a time where it would be convenient for their tax returns for their company. And they were just trying to, it it, it was a terrible, terrible time to be a Hellraiser fan because those movies were just not good enough. And, and the franchise was not in good hands. No, they were, they were just churning out, uh, like children of the corn style sequels for no reason. And now there's something that's going on, which is there's some people who are saying, yeah, Clyde Barker should get the rights back to his creation, right? Yeah. And I'm in that yeah. camp. You're in that camp. You know, it's, it's his it's his creation, and people have proven that they can't handle it. I mean, honestly, it, yeah. it's the, the the movies with with a few exceptions have just gotten worse and worse and worse, and and uh, the motivation behind them has been terrible. And and yeah. there's. And there's other people who listen to this news, and instead of being happy for Clyde Barker or happy for Hellraiser franchise, we're like, I think this is a terrible idea, and I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, I'm going to come out and say it is the Mr. H. I and and I you know you you and I watched this video. I watched it uh, last night, and th- I, I have some issues with what he's saying. He says his his main point that he harks on a few times is that Clive Barker is not the right man for the job, and it's like, you know, to me that comes off pretty arrogant because, well, then who is who? Who's the right man for the job if the creator of of Hellraiser isn't the right man for the job? And his arguments are basically, if he was going to make a good movie, he'd have done it already. Which is terribly unfair and doesn't uh, and doesn't that you know the the reason be, he, that he hasn't been able to make a Hellraiser movie is the Weinstein Company. Yeah, I you know so basically what he's saying is it's a bad idea because one Clyde Barker only wants to do this to get the rights and make money. Yeah. So it's only for money. That's that's the point that he harps on like three times or four times. Yeah. Um, which is. I mean, what I, I know the movies can have an movies are art and there's a business side to movie making, of course. I mean, Mr. Age himself, before he starts his video, before he starts talking about yeah. why he thinks it's a bad idea for Clive Barker to get the rights back to his own creation. 
he pushes his movie and for, it's for being crowdfunded minutes. right now. Yeah, for 10 yeah. minutes he pushes his the crowdfunding on his own movie. So of course there's a business side to movie making and and of course there is money involved. But at the same time, do you really not see how it's kind of right and proper for the creator to get the rights back to his own creation. I mean, let's say Mr. Age sold the rights like Clive Barker did to his short movie uh, to 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 get the budget to make it instead of crowdfunding it, yeah. which at the time it wasn't a thing in the 80s. <laughs> you crowdfunding was basically getting a producer. <laughs> that's that's how you made your movie. Uh, nowadays, people call it crowdfunding. But you're basically getting, instead of getting a few producers, you're getting thousands of producers on your movie. And none of them has any rights to say anything about your movie. And, you know, in some cases for certain of movies that are being crowdfunded right now, some of these movies sometimes may not even get made at all. But those people have no right to their movie because it's considered a donation. So once you give your movie, your money to a crowdfunding project – there's really is not much of a guarantee that those things will ever get made. Uh, it's it's done on faith, and unless it's properly stated in the crowdfunding goal that if you reach this certain tier of support, you'll be an executive producer, which very few projects ever do that, then you 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 don't even have a say in the project either. You're just you're just being a silent partner that comes in and says, yeah. "Here's money on the table to make whatever you want. Um, you go crazy." Anyway, so he says he only wants to do this for money. And then he says, uh, I've read and discussed some of the scripts that came out of Clyde Barker's production company that he had ideas for a Hellraiser movie, and they were, uh, quote, terrible. Okay, so he spoiled a couple of treatments and scripts that he got. I don't know where he got them from. I don't know how real they are but he did a couple of videos at one time saying this is the unfilmed clive barker treatment and, and script and blah 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 so he did that we never covered any of that we covered some treatments that we got that were written by someone else that were supposed to be for the much maligned uh hellraiser reboots that were trying to be made back in 2006 and then yeah. 2012 well, and or we whatever. did it with permission i mean that's the other big thing we weren't trying to you know we're never going to have the kind of hits that mr h has but we're also going to be respectful his his points are that he will clyde barker wants to do it for money if he got the rights back he would just yeah. go right back to selling them again and he only wants to make money can i cut I mean, in on that in here just a second because there was yeah. a so somebody on the youtube comments made the same argument that you did he said like Hey, what if I I'm going to make a sequel to you know and he named he named his you know crowdfunding movie. He said I'm I'm going to make a sequel to that, and uh, you don't deserve. He said something like and you don't deserve to uh, to have it back or something like huh. that. And and then uh, and then Mr. H cut in and in, in into the comment and he said he was paid handsomely for that you know for those rights and I would never sell my rights. And I mm -hmm. said, and so I couldn't help it. I came in and I wrote handsomely equals $10,000. And then he came back and he said, he makes money on every single sequel. And I just saw this like right before we started recording. But he came in and said, uh, he makes money on every single sequel. Does he? I don't I, I, know. I'm not, no, I, I mean, where does he get that from? I'm not sure that he, I'm not sure that Clyde Barker made any money from Judgment. He said, and every single movie that was made, he received money. He wasn't robbed. He made a financial decision. As an adult, you're acting like he was duped. He wasn't. Okay, but. But where is he getting that from? I, I mean, Clive Barker didn't even get, I mean, he made money from two, three, and four because he was involved. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean. Right. Mm hmm but from yeah. five onward, nobody asked him for a, nobody. Nobody came to him. Nobody asked him for for permission. Nobody said, "Hey, can you consult us with us for this Inferno?" Right? They Clive Barker read the script and he hated it, and that was you know. And it's like, well, we're not putting your name on here then. Right. So I think the real takeaway from this is that okay, so we've seen what Hellraiser in the hands of the wrong people ended up becoming, right? A, a bad franchise that even the hardcore fans like me say, I would rather not see another Hellraiser movie than to continue having these rehashed movies come out and just and just drag, you know, 
what could have been on, through the ground. I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't hold any hopes in the future that we'll be able to see a truly amazing, uh, you know, beyond the limits kind of Hellraiser movie. Be- just because I don't think audiences will ever be ready to see anything that would actually be true to the spirit of what the Cenobites are and the things that you could you can get a you can get away with a lot of stuff in a written page that you probably can't in a movie that goes into multiplex theaters. Okay. Because just because producers will say, I don't want this to be in the movie because this is going to be gruesome and terrible and you know, people are not going to watch it. Um so I don't hold a, a, a huge amount of faith that we'll ever see like a, a really big gothic version of Hellraiser as I would imagine it to be in my head when I read the Hellbound Heart, you know, when I read stuff like the Scarlet Gospels. I don't know that that will ever be a thing. I think people in the movie business will always try to narrow down Hellraiser to its formulas, which is there's a box, there's Cenobites, someone opens the box, Cenobite comes, twists and turns, boom, the end. And it's like, all right, so there's lightning in a bottle, right? And and you, it's hard to reproduce lightning in a bottle. This would raise another question of whether or not do we still need to keep franchises alive yeah. do we really need to make hellraiser a franchise right. isn't it enough just to have one or two good movies and then move on to something else and it seems like it's only in horror and like science fiction that people think this way and especially horror i mean you, you don't see like gone to the wind 12 or whatever right at, at its core the notion of a movie franchise is simply based on and this is my opinion Brand recognition, okay, putting butts in seats because this guy went to see the previous movie and we're going to use the same name on a different movie and he's going to be like, oh boy, there's another one of these. I'm going to go watch it yeah. whether or not it is good. And they know that every time they put something out with the name that people recognize that people will go see it and they will pay for a ticket. We, we, you know, we get double downloads every time we have the word Hellraiser in our in – our, um Oh, of in course. Our, in our title. Yeah, you know, of course. Like, because Hellraiser a, fans. That's a total come microcosm over. of the whole thing that you're talking about. Yeah. But the idea of franchise is an idea that was created mostly in the 90s and stuff, right? I mean, that's when everything that came out that was successful had to be let's figure out the formula, let's make more, and let's call it number two, number three, and whatever. And then. <laughs> yeah. And then that changed into let's just put colon at the end and and say Hellraiser Bloodline, Hellraiser Inferno. Yeah. So they don't call it Hellraiser Five, Hellraiser Six, Hellraiser Seven. Yeah, let's not draw attention to how much we're milking the the you know. The, yeah, yeah. The I mean, original you know concept. I mean, Jesus Christ! There's the the land before time, eight, nine, <laughs> or whatever. There's uh, right. there's Air Bud. 14 or whatever it's like yeah i I mean those things are not at that point a franchise is not about respecting the artistic integrity of uh uh, intellectual property it's about squeezing as much out of it yeah it's like people still like this crap keep making it yeah but you get only half as much as you got last time to make it do i want to believe that Clive, if Clive gets the rights back, that he would be free to make another Hellraiser on his own terms and be involved in that. Yes, I would love to believe that. It Is that what's really like, going to happen? It would I don't be like care. Consulting at the most. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think that he's going to go out of his way to stop movies unless they're terrible. You yeah, know what I mean, I think that mm-hmm. I think that he would just say, "Hey, just keep me in the loop." You know, yeah. and it's my property, so I'm gonna I'm entitled to my own compensation for it. You know, my creation, and keep yeah. me in the loop because I don't want you to make something terrible with it. Like he had given an example one time at a, 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 a in an interview where he said, "I I just don't want to see them." You know, I have oversight, and this was back in the early days, right? He's like, "I may I put my name on these. I have oversight." This was during Hellraiser three, I think, because I don't want to see them make a rap group out of the Cenobites. 
<laughs> you know, and 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 it's you know that's a that's a silly example, but it, but it's kind of like, yeah, it can go off the rails and become something completely different from the original intention of of you know the 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 movie and the book. Yeah, yeah. wasn't it uh, Hellraiser Revelations that Clive Barker went on Twitter back when he still used to Twitter? And he said something like, "I want people to know that movie is is no fucking son of mine. It's not even. It's not from the mind of Clyde Barker. It's not even from my butthole." <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, so that really showed. Another point that comes from this Mister Age um, is that. Um, so basically, another point that he says is that, okay, so if Clyde Barker was to make a, a, a good Hellraiser script, he would have made one already, which I guess. <laughs> I, he didn't like the treatment that he got or the script that he got, and he trashed it on a video, and he said it was going to be terrible, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's basically an opinion. I, I'm i not going to say whether or not he's right or wrong because it's yeah. an opinion, but uh, honestly, I didn't read that or, that script. I don't know. But, I mean, at least it comes from the creator himself. It's like, you know, telling, you know – it's. I, I just don't understand that reasoning um, because he never got a chance to actually be involved in something and have the someone come over and give him proper compensation for coming up with an original idea for Hellraiser. I mean, it, it's they've always been bringing in these writers, you know, like uh, Carl Dupre, that worked with Rick Boda, or you know, other other writers that have written these terrible scripts. It's sometimes. Uh, Neil Marshall Stevens, that sometimes were just scripts that were for some other horror movie, mm. and then they just pay the guy to be like, we're going to option your script, and we're going to bring in another guy to write Hellraiser and Cenobites into your script. Yeah. And uh, uh, it happened for Debtor. Uh, yeah. Neil Marshall Stevens had one script called Debtor, and then it became Hellraiser Debtor. And yeah. I remember reading uh, some comments of his in a, a writer's forum where he said, well, I got paid for the script, but I really hated what they did to my movie. I thought it was an original idea, and they just turned it into like a Hellraiser movie, and they just they just really messed up my script. And yeah. but I got paid, so whatever. But you know, stuff like that. Another thing that Mister H said was that Clyde Barker doesn't like Hellraiser anymore, and that the Scarlet Gospels was proof that Clive just wanted to destroy Hellraiser and everything that people love about Hellraiser. And that's what he said. Those were his yeah, words. And, okay? and I think that that's a big fallacy. I mean, I think, yeah, Clive Barker is tired of what Hellraiser has become. And and I saw the Scarlet Gospels as Pinhead was representing this runaway monster of the Hellraiser franchise, right? And its yeah. creator, which, you know, in the book was Lucifer, right, um, was tired of it and had to kind of kill it and put it down. I mean, I remember when Clive was talking about his original idea for making The Last Requiem, which was yeah. going to be a short story for this anthology called The Scarlet Gospels. Right, and that, and, right, and that was going to be the, the death of Pinhead, and he's like, sorry, Doug yeah. Bradley. That was the first yeah. thing he ever said about that story is that I'm I've had enough of this, you know, they've they really trashed the character in the movies and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kill him off. So it's exactly what you said. I mean, you could see the Scarlet Gospels as kind of an analogy to, you know, Clive Barker making a stand against the terrible sequels that were being put out and saying, I'm just going to kill this character on my own terms. Yeah. You know, I'm going to I'm going to be done with it and I'm going to I'm going to put an end to this. And that's how I saw it, too. That's yeah. how I saw the Scarlet Gospels was Clive Barker is putting a final period into the Hellraiser universe on his own terms. And he's had it. I mean, Anchor Bay released that Hellraiser uh, lament box with Hellraiser 1, 2, and 3 back in 2004? Yeah. yeah. Was it? It was like and, DVD only and not Blu-ray, yeah. I think, at least in the and U.S. Back then in the special features, there's an interview with Clyde Barker in the opening documentary. He says, I hope this is the last time I talk about this son bitch in movie. Because he, <laughs> he just yeah. had it by yeah. then, you know? Yeah. He was like – you know, you don't want to be pigeonholed just for one thing that you did and people forget about every other stuff that you did. Which you know. is a big portion of the Hellraiser fan community. I mean, honestly, that's all they ever want to talk about. And they divorce it from Clive Barker in a way. It's like, you know, yeah, yeah, he made Hellraiser, but I really like Inferno or whatever. And, you know, it, it's a it's a they're they're a bit, little bit different 
in I mean, that's ways. understandable. I mean, for some people, Hellraiser was a gateway into Clyde Barker. And for some people, Clyde Barker is a gateway into Hellraiser. Yeah. Or they just they just like Hellraiser and they like, I don't really like the other stuff, Clyde Barker. I'm not into Nightbreed. Yeah. I'm not into Weave World. I never really read his books. I just like Hellraiser. Yeah. That's valid. That's a perfectly acceptable. Like, you saw a movie, you liked it, just like I like Dune. But I never read all the books in the Dune series. No, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I never I, got into that. I you read know, the first like book that. and then the second book I read it and I didn't like it and that was kind of the end of it for me. It's like, no, I'm just going to I'm just going to stick to the first one from now on. Right. But for me, Hellraiser was like, hey, this is great. I want more and yeah. different stuff from this author. And hey, guess what? There's a lot of stuff here. Yeah. And I got into Cabal and then I got into The Great Secret Show and you know, Books of Blood, of course, was where I started reading Clive Barker. And and that was a great uh, gateway. Some people, you know, they just like Hellraiser. That's fine. Now, I think personally, just to put an end to this, it's just I, I, I think that the, the creator should be able to get his creation back uh, so he can deal with it in his own terms. If that means financial compensation, yes, I think he deserves that too, yeah. of course. If that means uh, he wants to sit on that, I don't think he wants to sit on that. But if that meant he wants to sit on the Hellraiser rights and make sure no other bad movies are made, I'm perfectly okay with that too because – I don't like the last few sequels. I mean, sure, Judgment was all right. I mean, I liked what Paul T. Taylor did. I have sympathy for the people who worked in Judgment. I like what um, um, Gary Tunnicliffe, I, I think he tried to do his best, and I think he did an acceptable job. But it's like, do I want Hellraiser to continue being like a low-budget franchise? No, not really. No. You know? Yeah. Well, and, and honestly, this, this criticism... It, and I'm, we're typically not really negative on this podcast, but I have to say, you know, it's coming from a guy who has a featured video on his channel that's a 20 minute video that's a reveal of his own face. He did, he spent <laughs> 20 minutes with building up to revealing his face and what he looks like. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh well, you know, it's it's the YouTube thing. Yeah, uh, God. I mean, YouTube, if you want to be a successful YouTuber, yeah. there's a lot of clickbait you need to do. There's a lot of stuff like that. Well, and he can uh, come back and look at the podcast versions of our of our, you know, YouTube channel and say, oh, this one only gets 20 views, you know, compared to my 8000 or whatever. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that, you know, he's he makes more. He's got a lot more clicks on YouTube than we do, for sure. And I'm sure he'll, I mean, I'm sure he'll point that out. I mean, listen, I don't hold any ill will towards Nathan age or whatever his name is. Uh, I just am not a subscriber. I'm not a fan. I, I saw his video just because we had to do this and because people told us, Hey, check out this. He thinks Clyde Barker shouldn't get the rights. I just went there to see what was his reasoning. I didn't think he made a good case no. personally. I, I don't think he made a good case about that. And I'm continuing to not be a subscriber or a fan or whatever, but he has every right to make the videos that he wants to do. Of course, that's that's completely up to him. Yeah. I just – I'm not about – he has a whole series of videos, which is, I hate this movie because so-and-so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's really – it would be really easy to do stuff like that and just, you know, just, just crap on everything. Yeah, it's easy to be negative about something. It's harder to to construct a good case or to defend something. Yeah. And in my case, I think we're doing the right thing here. I think Clyde Barker should get his rights back to Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. I think that the people who own the rights to Hellraiser have demonstrated they don't know what they're doing with it. They don't have a vision. They don't have an idea. They don't really have a, a any, any idea of what they're doing. And they're just holding on to that just for pure greed. Just out of pure greed saying, this is a property, we paid for it, it's ours. And the creator is saying, hey, I would like it back. You guys have not been doing anything right, and it's been over 30 years, and I would like to have the rights to my creation back. Well, and a part of his argument is that, no, Clive Barker's not going to make any movies. He just wants to. He wants the rights so that he can sell them back again. And he said, like, James Well, Cameron. that's his right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but that's it, up to Clyde Barker. Why are you second I, guessing yeah, what he wants to do? Right. That's or, not your job. That he would just sit on it and not make any more movies. And he's like, is that such a terrible thing? Yeah. Either you know, I mean, honestly, is ten movies enough? 
No, I mean, and just to be honest here, and just to be perfectly clear, we don't work for Clyde Barker. Yeah. We are not connected to Clyde Barker's production companies in any way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is purely our personal opinions, and you know, I mean, that's uh, as a fan, that's why we can get away with stuff like saying maybe Hellraiser shouldn't have any more movies. You think anybody who works for Clyde Barker would ever say that out loud? Yeah. No, <laughs> and I don't think anybody that works for Clyde Barker yeah. believes that there shouldn't be any more Hellraiser movies. They they probably think. If we got the rights to Hellraiser, yeah, we should yeah. make more movies because yeah. that's going to make us money, which is totally a premise, which is totally the right of the creator, you know, the to yeah. to capitalize on his creation. That's why, you know, <laughs> I mean, there's the myth of the starving artist, but, you know, art without an audience is incomplete. Yeah. So to have an audience in today's world, yes, there's business that comes into it. Um, people don't just go out in the street and start painting masterpieces on someone else's wall um, <laughs> unless you're a graffiti artist. And even right. so, I mean, that's not really what I would call a masterpiece. And sometimes they pay you to do that if you have a store or something. So anyway, my point is I think Clyde Barker should have the rights back to Hellraiser. Um, I'm interested, yeah. like you said, even if he gets the rights, that doesn't mean that he's going to shut down Spyglass and David S. Goyer's reboot of Hellraiser. It probably just means that he would be more properly compensated and involved yeah. in the in the rights to do that. No, As for the TV show, I mean... People I, think I, he's going to jump had. in and, and start directing again. And, you know, I'm, the, the, no, I don't think he's at a point in his life where he wants to do that. Yeah, but, I but mean, I if think you follow the Imaginer series, you know that Clyde Barker admits that even painting in his studio is hard for him to do now. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think that it's like he just would like to be consulted, you know, and he would like to have a say. And, of course, he should, you know, because it's that the Hellraiser se sequels have really gone off the rails. And it, and it would be kind of nice if it's, it's been, if they're going to keep making the movies, if they course correct it a little bit. In terms of a TV show for Hellraiser, I'm not a huge fan of the idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the Hellraiser films and their legacy, the book by Paul Kane, there's a page 225, 226. I'm just going to read a little segment here. Yeah. It says, in December 2004, Variety reported that Hellraiser was bound for television screens as an <laughs> hour-long weekly series. Okay, so it was oh, an hour-long weekly series. Wow. The people behind the proposed project were Panacea Entertainment, Park Avenue Entertainment, sounds familiar, yeah. and Blueprint Entertainment. While Dimension still owned the rights to the filmic versions of Hellraiser, the executive producer on the show, Eric Gardner, had represented the property since Larry Cuppen reacquired the New World Film Library from Ronald Perelman in 1991. Coupin was also slated to be involved as an executive producer in the series, which would apparently revolve around a tabloid journalist stumbling upon a plot hatched between Pinhead and a rich software magnet. Okay, so you remember we've talked about this before. We've talked about this stuff and how it seemed like a horrible idea. Yeah. And then when someone was talking about a Weave World TV show a few years ago, and they were saying there was going to be a pastry chef <laughs> and an app developer. Oh God, yeah. And yeah. I was like, what does that have to do with Weave World? So I'm not a big fan of these projects that try to like put something on, slap something on TV, just put a name on it. Like you know, they did that with Saint Sinner for Sci-Fi yeah. Channel, and you know they got a really interesting comic book. They took the name, slapped it on a crappy movie, Saint Sinner, and then I was like, what does this have to do with a comic book? Nothing yeah, at all. Yeah. Well, if they do make something, though, we will come at it with an open mind, and we'll check it out, and we'll reserve our judgment. But yeah, it's, it's, tough, to be, it's tough to be optimistic sometimes. It seems like criticism of this is coming from the position of we have to keep on making good Hellraiser movies and you know and we don't necessarily agree so it's like he, he's saying you know Mr. H's thing is saying like you know Clive Barker's not right for the job because he's not been pumping out all these Hellraiser movies he keeps trying and they don't get anywhere and he says because they're not any good and it's like that's that's kind of unfair I mean he they they tried uh, the, the Weinstein company proved that all they cared about was keeping it on life support until they decided that they had enough time to deal with the remake or whatever. I mean, I don't know what 
what Hellraiser projects he's talking about from Clyde Barker. He only talked about one treatment or one script yeah. that he re- that he spoiled and reviewed on his channel. I've never read that. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, and apart from that, when did Clyde Barker ever write a script for Hellraiser that was public that people know about? I don't know of any of that. Yeah. Do you know of any any projects that he's there's so many projects that he's tried to make? Well, that I think he's talking about because there was the 2014 um, remake treatment. It wasn't even a full script; it was just a treatment, hmm. right? And and uh, he had met with um, n- not Bob the Har- not Harvey. It was Bob Weinstein, right? And he mm-hmm. said that the the meeting went uh, pretty well. And then all of a sudden, you know, later on, then they announced Hellraiser Judgment. Right. Yeah. And so I think there was a treatment there, but, it, you know, just a treatment, not anything big, not like a full script or anything. Right. Yeah. Anyway, Screen Rant has a, an article that says uh, it's called Hellraiser Movie Legal Rights Explained. I mean, it seems like they do a good job of explaining some of this stuff. Um, I don't know if you want to add that to the show notes. Yeah. I put a link into our OneNote. Okay. And, uh, I, you know. I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what's going to happen. But all I can say is that we'll keep an eye out for whatever developments come out, and we'll let you guys know. Next up, we well, we've been working on an interview. Uh, schedules have been uh, difficult for that one. Uh, we've got Aberat three discussion coming up, and uh, and uh, a commentary for Halloween. You know, for the A to Z series, and then Imaginer eight will also come back to and and finish up the series. That's going to be fun. Uh, Imaginer series has been one of the most interesting ones in terms of discussion that I've been a part of, and I'm very happy to do these. Um, it, it's like returning back to when we were doing our episodes talking about each uh, Books of Blood um, story. Those were right at the beginning of our podcast, and they're, those were some of the most fun episodes that I, I, I've ever done for this. Yeah. And we actually got a comment on YouTube where someone was thanking us for doing the um, the Imaginer series. Because oh, wonderful. On, on our last one, on Imaginer 7, they said, you know, people hardly ever talk about Clive Barker's art, and I'm so happy that you guys did this. It's oh like, yeah. yeah! Thank you. You know that that was that was so nice, and I want to thank thank them. You know here because honestly, yeah, we could just keep on talking about Hellraiser, and we would get a lot more. <laughs> we would get a lot more downloads and 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 uh, and views and whatever. You know, but uh, but yeah, we're you know we do this because we love it, not because we're trying to we're trying to get as many as many you know podcast downloads as possible. Yeah, we don't make a living from this podcast. So. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Yeah. Well, uh, and this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com. We've got an archive of past episodes, news, features, and reviews, along with all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on every other place you can find podcasts. Share your thoughts with us and share our podcast with your friends. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that's not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.